Hello. So uh, we can probably start. So if you guys can move closer, then that would be great, because we will be uh, voting here. And uh, so I'm Anton Kex. I come from Estonia. I'm one of the co-founders of the company called Codeborn, which is a consultancy. And uh, we also use pair programming 100% of the time. So if you want to talk about that at the party, then you're welcome. And uh, I will be talking about Kotlin puzzlers. So uh, first, how can we save Java? So Java is outdated, not so cool anymore. And uh, it has lots of uh, volcanoes and earthquakes. It's really dangerous uh, to be in the Java world. So why not use Kotlin? Kotlin is a small island in the Baltic Sea. Uh, rarely no earthquakes, no thunderstorms, no hurricanes. So really safe to be. And it's a port port uh, uh, of uh, St. Petersburg. So it took Kotlin six years to get to 1.0, and an hour 1.5 to 1.2. Uh, they even changed the logo, so it was a really, I really missed that teapot. Uh, but of course, uh, making a new programming language is not rocket science. Uh, so given the amount of time, it should be perfect. But uh, during the same uh, time frame, actually, there, there's another company who managed to uh, make some rocket stuff as well. So, uh, but uh, let's talk about the puzzlers. Who have been to a puzzler talk before? OK, some of you. So basically, puzzlers are short programs with curious behavior that I will show on the screen in the IDE. Uh, I have errors and warnings turned off in my IDE. So it's a wor warning for you. So you don't try to get a hint from the IDE. Uh, so uh, the question would be, what do they print? And uh, you vote for the correct answer. And then we run the program and reveal, reveal the mystery. And uh, then somebody from you tries to uh, explain why the program prints what it does. And I have some flags here sponsored by JetBrains uh, as a prize. So if you, if you do that. So Kotlin puzzlers. Actually, I was inspired by the talk by Andrei Breslov and other guys of, <coughs> from JetBrains who actually told that Kotlin was specifically designed to avoid well-known Java puzzlers. So uh, of course, an uh, ideal programming language doesn't have any puzzlers. But Kotlin is pragma pragmatic, not ideal. So uh, there are lots of puzzlers <laughs> already known. Uh, I started collecting them maybe a year ago. And now there is quite a, uh, more than 50 already in my uh, repository on D GitHub that you can check later. And all of the puzzlers that uh, I run today, they, I run with the fresh Kotlin 1.2 release candidate. So uh, this is the GitHub repo that you can check for the other puzzlers. So I'll show you a selection of those. So let's uh, warm up with an easy one. So that's a small program. You, you see a variable, x, which <laughs> equals foo. And uh, it's checked if it is foo or not a foo. So who thinks that it is A, that uh, the program will print is foo? So some of you, yeah. I would also think, because Kotlin actually uh, calls equals here, if we are Java developers. So uh, who thinks it's not a foo? OK, there are a couple of people. OK, so those who. Uh, have attended any puzzler talks, you know that actually you need to vote for a non-obvious answer. So uh, who thinks it will not compile? OK, some of you. Um, actually, half of you. And uh, who thinks it will be typecast exception? OK, also some of you. OK, let's now run it. So I don't hear the drum roll. OK. And so the program does not compile. The correct answer is C. And that was just to run. Uh, it was just a warm up, and the, the thing is that Kotlin actually doesn't have the ternary operator. It still has the shorthand of it, uh, the Elvis operator, but they decided to skip the full blown stuff. So, uh, so you can think that Kotlin is uh, somewhat worse than JavaScript in this sense, but I hope they will add it at some point. So now let's go to the more crazy stuff. So we have a simple program here, it's like a function hello and a bunch of weird code in, inside of it. So uh, what do you think <laughs> this program would do? Uh, 
Who thinks that it will be just hello, A? OK, some of you. OK, who thinks it will be double hello? OK, there's still people <laughs> thinking that it can happen. OK, who thinks that it will not compile? And uh, I warn you, like, yeah, there are a lot of people. And I warn you, yeah, if you have an answer like that in the puzzler, then you should think uh, very seriously about that. So, and who thinks that it will be something else? OK, also s some of you. So let's uh, give it a try. For some reason, the drum roll doesn't work perfectly here, but uh, it prints just hello. There were only a couple of hands, so who wants to explain? So there is a hand there. Please uh, help me with the microphone. Can we see the code? Yeah. OK. So uh, return hello will actually um, compile because uh, it's an expression, so it can be used and it, 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 it could be understood as a unit, but it will be, uh, it, it will be run, maybe. It, it will be compiled and run before the throw and before the return, etc. Yeah, but so. why the hell can you write the code like this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, because, I because, it, because expressions in Kotlin are assignable. Yeah, very good answer. Actually, everything in Kotlin is an expression, and actually, uh, if you already, do you know what this expression actually, what is the result type of this expression? Yeah, it's nothing. So, and nothing can be assigned to anything. So that's why you can throw it a uh, thousand of times and you can return it again. And actually, uh, this code is just will never be executed because of the first return. So you, you got a flag. I don't know if you, somebody can pass it. Whoa. <laughs> maybe, <we laughs> okay, maybe we should skip throwing. So let's, uh, <laughs> uh, let's go uh, further. So we have a sneaky return puzzler. So that one is a classic one. So maybe you have seen it somewhere, maybe not. But uh, like, let's look at it. So there is a list of one to three, which is passed to a function. And then it's iterated. And uh, basically, numbers above or actually below two are printed. And then the OK is printed. So what do you think? If this, if for some reason doesn't work, and you will get one, two, three, okay, where are they? Who thinks? Nobody. Okay. Uh, who thinks that it will be one, two, okay? So it's a very logical answer. I would vote for that as well. So <laughs> who thinks that will be option C, one, two? Uh, I wonder why. Okay. And who thinks that it will be the infinite loop? Okay. Everyone believes in Kotlin, so let's uh, run it. And the drum roll, and we have one, two. So who wants to explain? Uh, I think the first one was there. So <clears throat> the for each runs each time, and it runs on the one, and it prints it, and then it runs on the two and prints it, and then it gets to three, and it is greater, three is greater than two, so it hits that return. And since it's not a labeled return, it returns the actual function and not just the for each, so it returns the whole function. And yeah, so it's returns. not Java. So if you want to emulate Java, you can do like that. So you're on the flag, so you can just pick it from here later. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so uh, yeah, in Kotlin, return actually returns from nearest function declaration. So another way of fixing that is to have, uh, to have a, like an anonymous function here. Then it will return from the function. So let's, uh, let's get moving. So uh, we have a code like this. So some of the puzzlers are already su submitted by the uh, uh, spectators of my other talks. So, uh, like this one. So we see very easy one. We, we have a variable called x, which is assigned to one, two, three. And then it's checked if it's string and an int at the same time. Then it's incremented. And uh, the length of the x is added. And so we get, I guess, one, two, seven, right? So and uh, actually, maybe this can be the result of the, of the new unknown, uh, uh, not so much talked about feature in Kotlin 1.2, where it can actually convert the uh, types on the fly. So let's see. So who thinks it will be still 1, 2, 3? OK, some of you. 
who thinks that it will be 1 to 7? Yeah, we believe in new features in Kotlin. <laughs> or who thinks it will be class cast exception? Yeah, maybe it should be. And who thinks that this is a nonsense code and should not compile? Of course, not so many, but I warned you about the last option. So <laughs> let's run it. So we have, and it's one, two, three. So who wants to explain? Yes, here. Um, I know the behavior changed recently, like you were saying, but normally, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, normally, whenever you're, we have a, a variable, then it's just, and you do it in a print line, it's just going to run its two string if it's not a string. Uh, but the increment plus length is never being called because x was never possibly assigned as an int. Yeah, that's, the, that's correct. Basically, you are on a flag, but, uh, but I wonder why this code compiles. Actually, actually, I was lying about the new feature in Kotlin. There is no such features. Kotlin is a statically typed language, but I would guess that this kind of code should not compile because, yes, this is an impossible condition. But if we look at the disassembly, actually, the code for this is actually generated, but it is never executed. So that's a trick how to fool the compiler. So let's uh, go to the next one. It's called the order. So this one also was submitted. And uh, very easy class. We have uh, one variable, uh, initialization block, and uh, function, which is called. And we just uh, create a new instance of this class. So what do you think? Like we're actually printing the length of the C, of the uh, property C. So who thinks that it will be zero? Yeah, logical answer, couple of hands. Uh, who thinks that it should be null? OK. And who thinks that it will not compile? Yeah. Nice, nice. You really believe in uh, guys who write the compiler. OK. And who thinks it will be something else? Totally something else. OK. There are some people. So let's, let's run it. So the drum roll. That doesn't sound nice. And do you remember the guys promised that that we'll never, ever get null pointer in Kotlin, in pure Kotlin? There is no interrupt here. So who can explain? Yeah. So the private val is never instantiated. So when you call the, uh, it, it shouldn't compile because um, it's never instantiated anywhere. And so it's like, hey, you either have to instantiate this or make it nullable, which it's not nullable. So, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, not, I mean it's if not it's very uh, exactly correct, but probably you are thinking the right thing. OK. So, so it either has to be the, it either has to be declared null or it has to be. Smart to, uh, yeah, actually, the the code compiled. The code compiled and it produced oh, a null, null pointer? pointer exception at runtime. So maybe somebody else. Oh. I think there is a hand here. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's allowed to instantiate vals in the init function, but because you call the the function first. Uh, it, it's not instantiated yet, um, and yeah, that tricks the compiler. Yeah, and it's actually, this kind of thing should actually be caught by the compiler, but it's not. It's actually, uh, I have another one here, uh, you can look at it uh, later, uh, which also have a similar one, another way, more complex way of getting a null pointer in Kotlin. So there are probably even more ways coming, but Hopefully, these kind of issues can be fixed, but the guys from JetBrains already told me uh, yesterday that it's really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's get the next one. It's called One Child Policy. So here we have uh, a, like a basic, like a tree-like structure design. So we have a class called Node. It's open, so we can uh, extend it uh, in parent, and we actually create two childs here, child one and child two. And uh, when we call the lookup method on the node, we print its name. So basically, we have a parent, child1, child2, and uh, we just create the parent. So uh, who thinks that it will print child1 and child2? 
Okay, you need some time, I see, <laughs> from yours. <laughs> so basically, the printing happens here when the apply function calls the lookup on uh, both of the newly created child's children. So you call lookup on child one, you call lookup on child two. And of course, there is a trick. <laughs> So who thinks it will be child one, child two? The, the easiest answer. Nobody thinks, OK. I would think that it will be child one, child two. OK, who thinks that the second child will be gone and only first will be there? Child one, parent, is one person, OK, or maybe two. OK, who thinks it will be parent and child two? OK. There's some others, and who thinks it will be none of the above, something else, doesn't compile, exception, whatever, okay, some people. So let's get it running. So it's child one and parent. So uh, who can explain? Yes. It's terrible code. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the, the disclaimer about the puzzlers. Don't, okay. <laughs> don't write code like this, <laughs> of course. So there's a function called child returns nullable node. Yeah. Which is essential. And the first one applies to the nullable one. So, so it's invoked on the node result here. And that's why we see child one. But then the second one cannot be applied on the nullable, but it's, I mean, it's applied on the nullable because I think you can apply it on nullable, but the method call goes to the outer class, which is a parent, and then, yeah, 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 that's Yeah, yeah, so I'm terrible. giving a hint here for everyone to understand. So if we enable the errors, actually you cannot call the uh, lookup on child two, and that's why the compiler sees that the next available lookup is on parent and calls it. So that's the trick. And so don't, don't do like that, basically. <laughs> then, then everything will be fine. So yeah, well earned flag. So let's go further. We have uh, the puzzler called two lambdas. So um, very easy one. Again, we have a type alias L, which is uh, Lambda, taking string as a parameter, returning a unit. And uh, we declare a function that takes two of these and uh, with the default values of empty lambdas. And actually, I will do this thing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we call both of the provided lambdas here, one and two. And, uh, and we use two different styles of calling uh, of the fu foo function. So, who thinks that it will be one, one, two times one? Okay, two, maybe. Okay, who thinks it will be two, two? Nobody, okay. Who thinks it will be one, two? Okay, that makes sense. It should be one, two. It's written in that order, right? So, and who thinks it will be something else? Okay, the, the most of the people. So let's now run it. So, and we get two, one. So. Uh, when you omit the parentheses, uh, when a lambda is passed without parentheses, it has to be the last argument uh, of the function. So that first call to foo, uh, we actually pass two as the print. And yes. the second one, we pass just the first argument, and then we let the default argument of two be. Yes, that's correct. An empty lambda. So basically, sometimes when you omit the parentheses, uh, it can be very dangerous. Maybe something else will happen, not not the same thing. Otherwise, I would think that yeah, it can be the same. So correct. The last parameter is uh, past the lambda without the parentheses, and uh, with the parentheses is the first one. So let's take the next one. It's called the property override. So here we have a little bit more code. So we have a class called named. It declares a property called name, and it overrides the getter. 
and uh, if name is null, it's nullable, then we return unnamed. <coughs> then I have a class called person. It extends the named, and uh, it actually overrides uh, the property. And uh, the setter will actually add Mr. To the, to the name. So I guess this is very common in the United States, right? So, and we create a new instance of person. We assign it the name. Basically, we call this setter for the, our Java developers. And uh, we then call the getter. So easy. So who thinks that uh, I will still be Anton without the mister? OK, people are hesitating, but, but still, <laughs> some of the hands go up, so that's good. OK, who thinks that I will become a mister Anton? OK, many people. And uh, who thinks that I will lose my name? Also some people. OK, and who thinks that it will be null for some reason? I don't know. <laughs> OK, let's. Uh, there is no option it will not compile. Otherwise, everyone else would vote. <laughs> so uh, let's go. So drum roll, and it's unnamed. So where did my name go? Uh, or maybe somebody who haven't yeah. answered yet? Yeah, maybe here. Or Terrible code. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe actually you actually have answered. Maybe somebody no, else no. wants to okay. answer. <laughs> because <laughs> I know that you know. <laughs> you already got the flag. Okay, uh, I can give my flag to one. <laughs> uh, basically, I think Kotlin generates private field for every property. So your super field is different from the child field that you reference in the setter. So basically, when you call in the getter like super.name, it's not seeing your field that you declared in the child class. Yeah, that's actually that's correct. I will explain a little bit more. So uh, uh, th there is a concept of backing field for the property. And uh, here we have a property name, which has uh, one backing field where the name is stored. And it belongs to a class named. So when, uh, when we want to override the property, it's actually a, a weak point in Kotlin syntax at the time, I think. So it's very easy to introduce a new backing field with the same name. So basically, this uh, class person it introduces a new backing field uh, because we assign a value to it, like this here. And, and really, the getter, it still delegates to the backing field of named, but the setter would uh, set the field of person. And that's why the named, the getter, still like, is left as null. And we get this. So yeah, how, how to fix that? Somebody knows? Yeah, you can, you can also <laughs> like, omit this, for example. Or like, there are many options. Or you, you can like, remove this. And you, you can actually do like this. Like, super.name equals when you are overriding the field, then it will both of the getter and setter will use the backing field of the parent class. So, so you'll not get the flag you already have. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, now look at some uh, operator overriding. So it's a fun feature, like James Gosling in 1995 decided to omit this feature from Java, but uh, Kotlin guys told us that no, it was a mistake. We still need to overwrite operators. So uh, you can see we can uh, define our own plus operator, uh, which will actually make a mistake to this addition, and it will add an addition one, additional one to that. And we just call it three times in three, three different ways. Like Kotlin syntax allows us to do that. So uh, who thinks that, uh, and basically minus one plus two is one, so who thinks that our operator for some reason will not work and we still get one all three times? So, yeah, there is at least one brave person <laughs> who thinks that. Okay, who thinks that uh, all, all of the three will actually uh, add an additional one to these operations and uh, we get two, 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 at least. It will be consistent, yeah, is that <laughs> at least one person as well. That's good. So who thinks that we will get different results every time? So, oh, there are quite many people. Are you all 
like experienced Kotlin developers. You get these <laughs> mistakes all the time. Okay, and who thinks it will be also like two minus four minus four? Okay. Okay, some hands. So let's run it. I don't get why my prime roll is not working properly. So yeah, you get the different result every time. So who can explain why I for each of the cases? Who haven't answered yet? I think the hand is here. Yes? Okay. Who wants to explain? Okay, there is a hand there. Okay, yeah, that's correct, that the regular plus actually it already exists and fortunately we cannot redefine that, so we, we can avoid all the pitfalls that we have in C++. So that one works properly, we get one as a result. So the second one is, an, uh, be, is because the function is declared as an infix, so we can actually call it and uh, get the result of two, because this function adds another one here, so we get two in the second case. And the third case is the funniest one, so you probably know. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> that's, okay. a, that's what I was going to say, that oh. the minus operates on the one plus two using the original plus function. That's yeah. not int. So the thing is, yeah, if uh, the, the int class, it already has the function int, so we cannot define a new extension function that will shadow the original function. So the original plus is called here, but uh, the problem is that it's called like this. So this is a big, huge, huge problem in my, in my mind <laughs> in Kotlin. I don't know, I think, I really hope that th they can fix it, but there will be compatibility problems. Probably somebody already relies on that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the way to fix it, of course, is like this. So we get the, uh, the expected one as a result. So, but it's crazy with this minus. Um, I really have a problem with uh, giving the flag here, but I will give the, okay, let, let's give it to that guy. <laughs> okay, that's, uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> you have another chance. Okay, now we have a really nice uh, puzzler called Mars. So let's imagine we have a population on Earth. We have several cities like San Francisco, Tallinn, where I come from, and Kotlin is an island. And by the way, the city Kronstadt is uh, on that island. It has a population of 43,000 people. And, uh, and basically, we create a, uh, an instance of population, and we delegate uh, populations of these cities by map. So it's a very nice feature in Kotlin language. So you can delegate properties to a map. And uh, when we provide a map with some correct values from Wikipedia, of course, and, uh, and then many years have passed and Elon Musk has sent us all to, to the Mars. And uh, so we just got an empty map and the Earth is like deserted. So, and then we print how many people is left in all of these cities. So um, who thinks that will be Zero, zero, zero. So all the people are gone, really. So, yo, one, two, couple. Okay. So yeah, where does do the zeros come from? That's an interesting question. So who thinks that uh, it's really hard and probably Elon Musk will fail and will not send us all to Mars? So yeah, some of the people don't believe in Elon Musk. It's a pity. So. <laughs> Let's see uh, who thinks that will be null pointer exception that we are promised that we will never have. Okay, some other people. And who thinks that will be that it will be no such element exception? Yeah, this one is popular. I would guess too, because like empty map, there should be no value with this key. But let's see. The drum roll. And we have, uh, like, as we can see in the movies, it's really hard to survive on Mar Mars. So, so basically, we're not going there. So um, who can explain? I think the first one was there. 
So when you instantiate the population class, you give it the first map um, that is actually populated with data. And when you set up the delegates, it has a reference to that map. So when you go and you overwrite the city's property of population, the delegate is still the original map. You've only overwritten the property. Yeah, that's correct. Actually, uh, even though the cities here is a var, so you can change. It's, uh, it's a property by itself, but uh, the delegates, they actually store their own instances to the original map. And that's why they actually still like, work with it. So if we would clear this map, then uh, no such element exception would be thrown. But otherwise, it has no effect. So let's get moving. So we have another crazy one. So the love for exclamation marks in Kotlin. <laughs> you know, uh, this one is called antimatter because in Kotlin you can create matter from a null. So basically you can convert <laughs> null to a unit. And uh, so uh, two operators overwrite, overridden on nothing. And uh, you, guys <laughs> you guys really know that the type of the, the inferred type of foo is what? That's a bonus question. Yeah, the inferred type of foo is, of course, nothing, uh, nullable nothing. So if there is no other type provided, then it's nullable nothing, the type of just null but inferred by the compiler. We can even verify that. It's too small for you to see, but it is. So basically, we can do this kind of stuff with the foo. And uh, so the matter is, uh, you need to count the exclamation marks. And you need to decide what, what will happen. So, who thinks that in the end we will uh, apply everything and we will, from the null, we still get null? So, no uh, antimatter effects. <laughs> so, nobody. Yeah, it's probably impossible. We, we need to get something from the null. So, who thinks it will be units? No, it's quite logical. So, you probably counted that there are odd number of exclamation marks here, where they are like the not operators, so we will be left with the unit in the end, and we do something with that here. We basically assert that it's a, it's a not null two times. We can also add a couple of times more <laughs> for clarity. And so if you're really sure that it's a, it's a not null, then in your code you can write like that all the time. <laughs> And uh, uh, who thinks it will be Kotlin null pointer exception? Yeah, and this is the exception that is thrown when the null assertion is, uh, doesn't work. And who, who thinks that it will not compile because it's uh, some crazy code? Yeah, some people, of course. This is a good option always to, to go for. So let's see what happens. And the code does not compile. So who think, who voted for not compiling? Yeah. Um, that's terrible code. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I really I appreciate. Think, <laughs> I think that you cannot manipulate a nothing at all. So you cannot extend it. You cannot. It does not exist. So you cannot create a function that extends it or takes it as a parameter. Uh, that's incorrect, unfortunately. Ah. <laughs> Who else? Actually. You can read the reason why it's not compiling. <laughs> Kotlin is supposed to be giving very good, uh, very good error messages sometimes. <laughs> so, anybody else? Yep, yeah, here. The compiler doesn't know which method to invoke. You have the same method signature twice. Yeah, that's what it says, but why? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because they have the same method signature. I guess I don't know the technical details behind it, but you can't have two methods with the same method signature. Like, that's not a thing. Uh, that's not exactly correct. Maybe, maybe, maybe you will try. Any, or, um, uh, um, unit inherit, sorry. Does unit inherit from nothing or the other way around? Uh, unit, no, no, no. Unit inherits from any, and nothing is actually assignable to any type. So, <laughs> could it be that it is because nothing is nullable? The, the well, your your overload is on the nullable nothing, which in turn is a unit because of the nullability. 
Not quite. Okay, I'll answer that myself. I actually already answered that. So the problem here is that there is a ambiguity here. So when you're calling this not operator and you're calling it on nothing, the, the type of foo is nothing. And I already told you that nothing is assignable to any type in Kotlin. So basically, uh, it means that for this exclamation mark, both of the not functions actually match. So because you can uh, call it on a nothing and you call it on a unit because nothing is, is assignable to unit. Nothing is assignable to anything. And <laughs> this the same stuff when we had multiple return statements, the same reason actually. And that's why it doesn't compile. But otherwise, the most logical answer would be Kotlin unit, of course, because you just uh, convert it several times to unit and then you just assert it several times. So I will leave one of the flags to myself. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, look at this one. It's called weird chaining. So this one is actually submitted by one of the other speakers at this conference. Ah, oh, you are here. Very nice. Uh, so uh, we have a really simple one, if else, if else stuff, like we use uh, in Java all the time, and we print number sign, like we have um, numbers, negative, zero, and positive, and we print these signs for all of this. Like, pretty, pretty easy. Like, uh, so who thinks that this code just works? So we get negative, zero, and positive, option A. So nobody believes in Kotlin anymore. <laughs> 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 OK, <laughs> one hand, nice. OK, who thinks that the negative and zero, and for, for some reason, positive will be gone? There's one hand, maybe two, three, OK. Uh, who thinks that it will be just negative and positive, and the zero will be omitted? OK, there are also some hesitating hands. And uh, who thinks that it will be zero positive? One, two, like three, maybe? OK. And the rest, none of the above? There is no such options here. <laughs> OK, let's run it. And we here have zero positive. So I think there is a hand. Uh, just a guess that the let is binding to the, um, not the complete if else, if else, but rather just the um, latter part, if and else. Or not? Yeah. Can you repeat that? So, <laughs> uh, Like, I that let doesn't apply to all the cases, it yeah. only applies to the second half, like if, else. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct. The flag is yours, so basically the code uh, works like this. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> so uh, <coughs> yeah, the if else is a single expression, and let is called on the last expression, and the first if is like part of another expression. So of course, if you want to fix that, you would write a very nice code, and it will look like this. But uh, as I heard it several times already, it's a terrible code. Don't write code like this. <laughs> Of course, don't use let on the uh, if else directly. <laughs> Add parentheses <laughs> at least. So let's have a next one. So we have a really nice, really nice puzzle. So we have a variable called i. It's 10.5. Uh, what is the type of i? Probably you know, it's double. Yeah, it's double by default. So, and we use the very nice when uh, syntax. When we check if it's in the range of 1 to 10, then we print in. If it's not in the range, we print not in. Or if it's something else, we print else. So, would, what would that be? So, who thinks it's in the range? Yeah, some of the people. OK, what are you thinking? I don't know. <laughs> really weird. <laughs> I think I would vote for B. <laughs> it's not in the range. Come on. <laughs> Who thinks not in the range? Yeah. <laughs> Very few people. OK. Who thinks it will be else? Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> that's, that's the winner, probably. Or with not compile? Yeah, probably. J 
checking that double is in a range of ints. It doesn't make really sense. Kotlin is a type safe language, right? So let's uh, run it. And the correct answer is it's in the range. Who can explain? There were <laughs> many hands. Yes, please. I'm guessing it converts the double to int and then does the comparison. Is it in the range? Yeah, it's, it's the correct answer. You got the flag. But the thing is, if you would run this code with Kotlin 1.0, that would work correctly. <laughs> the answer would be not in. <laughs> For some reason, at one point in 1.1, they actually fixed or improved the code here. Actually, I don't hear, uh, see the source, unfortunately. But actually, yes, they, they do truncate the double to int, and then they check, and it's uh, really wrong. I hope they will fix it again back like it was in 1.0. And uh, the next uh, puzzle is uh, called overextension. So you can extend many things in Kotlin. So how about that? We have an operator function called invoke, which actually takes the uh, receiver and uh, adds the lambda that is provided to it. So we have the extension function called z, or you say z in the United States. And uh, it adds an explanation mark here. And uh, we also overwrite the to string and we add another explanation arc, mark exclamation arc at the end so and we have this funny thing here so will it compile <laughs> i don't know so who thinks it will be a explanation mark x you need some time no okay there's one hand anybody else okay who thinks it will be x, y? OK. More people. Who thinks that it will be x, y with an exclamation mark at the end? Yeah. Nice. But I told you that to, you, you cannot ex add an extension function with the name of already existing function. But uh, who thinks it will not compile? Yeah, it's nonsense code. Why should it compile? OK, drum roll. And uh, yeah, the correct answer is x, y. So who knows the reason? It's there. OK, so it actually runs as if you didn't define the two string extension method. And the reason is that if a method exists and an extension method also exists, Kotlin will always call the, 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 real, metho the real method. And the string dot to string uh, exists in the string class. Yeah, so this one is not called, but this invoke is actually, it is called. So basically, you can uh, write things like that. It's useful for DSLs. You can invoke uh, a string, basically, with a lambda, which is. Uh, provided here and it's added to x. That's why it's x, y, and uh, the z, z at the end actually adds another exclamation mark here. So that's a little bit puzzly. So I don't have any flags, but I have a uh, different thing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> OK. And uh, yeah, you can still have the, OK. And the last one is. Uh, there is a proverb in Estonian language. It's called uh, "Good child has many names." You already want to answer? No, I want to ask a question about the previous. Yeah. Okay. Is there any way to call that string method? That two-string method? Does, is, is it? Uh, no, no. There is no way to call this thing. Once you define something, yeah. you can't use. Yeah. Yeah. That's unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> true. Yeah. I would also think that it should be a warning, but there is no warning at, at this time. So. so. Yeah. Would, why would you, you uh, can call it from Java, by, by the way, because it will generate a static <laughs> two-string method with a parameter. <laughs> <laughs> why would that? Why like why would uh, dot to string on a string even exist? Because print line, it's like why would it call dot to string on a string? It's already a string. It doesn't need to typecast anywhere, right? Yeah, here it would, but print, print line actually, I think it pr uh, calls to string on, uh, on other objects that it doesn't know about. But for a string, I think there's an over overloaded version which just 
prints the string. Actually, there is not. Uh, there is uh, only the any version which calls to string in any, any case on a string. So, and uh, the last one, so the proverb, this good child has many names. So we have a class C with a function called sum. It has two named parameters uh, with default values and just returns the sum of them. And there is a class D which extends C and uh, overrides the function sum and calls the super, super function. And we basically have uh, two instances of it. Both of them, actually we have one instance and two uh, references to the D. Uh, and we just call this function two times and we pass the x as zero. So you can see the default values are one and two. So who thinks that it will be two, two? Where are they? Okay, there's one brave guy here. <laughs> Who thinks it will be 1-1? One, one? Nobody. Okay. Who thinks it will be 2-1? Okay, more people. That's good. And who thinks that it should not compile? Yeah, I would also think that <laughs> probably it should not compile. Because if you have noticed, their x and, uh, and y here are actually mixed up. So let's uh, run it. And what we have, the correct answer is 2, 1. So, who can answer? <laughs> Somebody who haven't answered yet, please. Um, okay, <laughs> the rest. <laughs> okay, there's uh, behind, yeah. I'm not really sure, but the second, when it does C, is C equals to D. Does that make it not a D, like a D class, but a C class? So it'll call um, the regular super sum? Oh, uh, sorry, I confused <laughs> myself. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> so on the, first, on the first call, it uses the definition in sum, or in C. So x equals. In the first call, it uses a definition in C, so x equals zero, y equals two, it prints two. In the second definition, it uses, in the second call, it uses a definition in D, um, and you're using, uh, it, so x equals zero, the second parameter is zero, the first parameter is default, it switches them, so you're setting x, is using the default value for x, because you didn't specify y, and then the yeah. second value, y, you set to zero. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So the reason here is that the GVM uh, provides the polymorphism, so basically the correct sum is called. Uh, in both, both cases, actually, uh, this method is called, because we have an instance of D. But the Java doesn't have the notion of, uh, of resolving the named parameters uh, dynamically, so it is resolved statically by the compiler, and uh, it actually looks at the type of the reference, not at the actual instance. So that's why it's 2, 1. So. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, by the way, you have the, the small souvenir. So uh, when I gave a, another Puzzler talk in Kiev uh, this year, there was this guy sitting. It was a Java conference. There was this guy sitting, and he says that I'm waiting until somebody starts writing in Kotlin. Now we have Kotlin Conf, and we have lots of people already writing in Kotlin. I'm pretty happy about that. Don't uh, look at the puzzlers. Puzzlers are really terrible code, and you need to write the good code. So thanks again.